Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Erie News and today is April 13th, 2024, Saturday, April 13th, 2024, and our first story as always, my favorite source, Stranger Than Fiction Stories, and the story is titled Death by Suggestion. On September 19th, 1911, Lady Frances M. Garnet Orme was found dead in a room at the Savoy Hotel in the hill station of Mussoorie in northern India. The body was carefully laid out as if posed after she died, and the doors were locked from the inside. A post-mortem examination found the presence of prussic acid. Two months later, her companion, Eva Mount Stevens, was arrested at Yancey after she left Lucknow. The woman had been staying at the Savoy Hotel, which was a favorite of the wealthier British Raj who lived in the provinces of Agra and Oud. To escape the summer heat, Mussoorie had become a favorite destination since 1838. The Savoy was built in 1902 on 11 acres overlooking the Himalayas. Miss Garnet Orme had been living in India for the last 16 or 17 years at a house in Lucknow where she spent most of her time. She occasionally visited her family in England. Miss Mount Stevens, 35, had been her companion since April 1911 when they stayed at another hotel in Mussoorie. They came to the Savoy in September. The women had met three or four years before at Naini Tal, where they discovered they were distantly related through marriage. Eva Mount Stevens left shortly before the lady's death to Lucknow, which is why it took two months before the authorities caught up with her. One of the most incriminating clues against her was that she benefited greatly under the terms of Garnet Orme's will. In February 1912, Miss Mount Stevens was put on trial at the High Court at Calcutta on the charge of poisoning her benefactress. What made the story even more sensational was the rumor there was a, quote, strong suggestion of occultism, end quote. It was reported the companion was involved in the mysteries of the Crystal Globe and involved Lady Garnet Orme in it to the point that she foresaw her death while gazing in the Crystal Globe. The lady was described as a lonely 50-year-old who believed so strongly in the vision that she prepared for her own death. She had described Eva Mount Stevens as a great authority on spiritualism and a perfect medium to her acquaintances. The prosecution alleged she used prussic acid and had motive and opportunity to commit the crime. She was accused also of making false statements in which she denied buying the poison which killed Lady Garnet Orme. The defense claimed she committed suicide spurred by the death of Mr. Grant, her fiancé, in 1897. This event caused her great grief and, coupled with an illness, was believed to have driven her to commit the act of self-destruction. During the trial in 1912, Alexander Grant testified that Miss Orme came to India in 1893 when she was engaged to his brother. A year later, his brother died while she traveled to England to visit her family. He had maintained his friendship with her and said she was influenced easily by other persons. It was pointed out that Miss Orme used to always wear around her neck two keys and a charm, which she said had been given to her by the spirit of a Mrs. Winter, her guardian angel. She once remarked that Miss Mount Stevens had the power to make people ill if they offended her. During the trial, it was alleged that Mount Stevens told Miss Orme she would find death in England every time she spoke of wanting to take a trip home. She also complained that if Miss Orme went home, she would marry a doctor she was engaged to in England and leave all her money to him. In March 1912, Eva Mount Stevens was acquitted of the murder charge. She was left as the sole inheritor of Miss Orme's fortune, which was £12,000 with other personal effects. This was contested by Hunter Garnet Orme, who claimed his sister did not have a sound mind when she executed the will. In October 1912, the courts dismissed Mount Stevens' application for probate on the ground of fraud and undue influence in connection with spiritualism and crystal gazing. The judgment gave probate to Miss Orme's relatives. What would never be allowed as evidence in court proceedings could not stifle the gossip that swirled among the Raj and those in England, which was that Eva Mount Stevens had tampered with Lady Garnet Orme's bottle of sodium bicarbonate by adding prussic acid to it. The other alternate explanation was that through use of her spiritual power, she had induced her benefactors to add the poison herself. The murder of Lady Garnet Orme 
appears to have inspired Rudyard Kipling when he wrote to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle about a story which, with an element of suggest murder by suggestion, in their correspondence, the crime at the Savoy in 1911 is mentioned. Kipling and Conan Doyle met in November 1894, when Conan Doyle and his brother spent two days at Kipling's American home while they toured the country. They continued their friendship via correspondence and eventually they became distant neighbors in Sussex when Kipling moved back to England. They read each other's works as they were published. They both were, they were both Freemasons and held an interest in the paranormal. Kipling was also a friend of William John Dyer Burkett that presided over the murder trial. They were both members of the Masonic Lodge Independence with Philanthropy No. 391. Judge Burkett stated at the conclusion of the trial that the truth of what happened to Francis Garnet Orme would most probably never be learned. He died on March on May 19, 1918, age 46 from pneumonia and is buried in Nanital. According to author Ruskin Bond, Agatha Christie's first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Stiles, published in 1920, was supposedly inspired by the murder of Lady Garnet Orme. The story introduced the detective Hercule Poirot. Other unverified rumors attached to this crime was that Eva Mount Stevens returned to England and Lady Garnet Orme's physician lost his practice in Missouri when whispers swirled that he had conspired with Mount Stevens to murder the older woman. A disturbing coincidence, if indeed it was one, was the death of Charles Jackson a painter known to those involved in the case who died two months after Lady Garnet Orme, supposedly of cholera. Whether he had contact with Eva Mount Stevens or there was another reason, police decided to exhume the body on December 23, 1911 and found it to be well-preserved, a sure sign of arsenic poisoning. The Garnet Orme family's original name was Robinson. In 1882, they were allowed by Royal Decree to change it. Interestingly enough, in 1905, the Garnet Orme family was involved in the excavations in Egypt and discovery of the temple of King Mentutnetep III of the 11th dynasty, which was about 2500 BC. Perhaps this inspired Agatha Christie to write the short story The Adventure of the Egyptian Tomb, which was published in 1923, where Detective Poirot investigates the death of people that were present at the opening of the tomb of the dead pharaoh Menhera. It is not surprising that Frances Garnet Orme is said to haunt the Savoy, supposedly looking for her killer. But in truth, if she died by her own hand, there is no mystery there. If it was her greedy companion, it came as no surprise to her. Perhaps what binds Frances to this earth is that the afterlife is not what she thought it would be after spending all that time gazing at a crystal ball. So there you go. This poor lady, whether she did it herself, she was lonely, she was influenced, or she was actually murdered, inspired two stories, uh, two Agatha Christie stories, and Conan Doyle and Rudyard Kipling were tossing, I guess, around the idea of that death by suggestions. Like, in other words, that, in other words, that her companion had a hand in her death, but not exactly, how's, what's the word I'm looking for? Act, didn't actually do it. The next story is also a stranger than fiction story and it's titled Inez's Ghost. A few days before Christmas 1900, a 12 year old girl named Inez came home from school on Friday afternoon. She told her younger brother she was going inside for a moment and when she re failed to return, he went to search for her. He saw something reflected in the mirror that faced the open closet that sent him screaming from the room. What Otto Gibson saw reflected in the mirror of his sister's bedroom was her body hanging inside the closet. Her jump rope was tied around her neck. A servant girl who came upstairs ran to a neighbor's house for help, but when they arrived, it was too late. Inez lived with her brothers Otto 9, Hugo 16, and her uncle Thomas Dick Gibson and his wife Margaret, better known as Judy, who had adopted all three children. Her biological parents, Sylvester Gibson and Nancy Angeline Bundy, married in 1882. In the next 10 years, they had three children. However, in November of 1893, Nancy had married William Dickey, which indicated the couple had divorced within the first decade of their marriage. Neither parent wanted their children, which is how they came into the care of their paternal uncle. Perhaps the trouble between Inez's parents went deeper than marital incompatibility. In April 1901, 
Sylvester Gibson was sentenced to Montana's penitentiary at hard labor for four years on a charge of assault in the first degree. In 1903, his second wife, Anne, was granted a divorce while he served his sentence. In addition to the divorce, she received a band of horses on the range near Gilt Edge, Montana. Sylvester Gibson died in 1934 without any family present at the time of his death. He was buried in the Old Miners Cemetery in Wyoming. Thomas Gibson and his wife were prosperous grocers in Malvern, Iowa. They had been at their store that afternoon when Inez ended her life. At the coroner's inquest, it was determined that Inez had indeed committed suicide despite being well-loved by her family and classmates. The only reason that could possibly explain why she would take this action is that she was despondent after falling below her usual average in her school examinations. The coroner's jury then changed the verdict to accidental death, explaining that she had a habit of climbing about in the closet and she somehow hung herself with a jump rope. It's unknown if this verdict was changed since it was difficult to believe such a young child would kill herself. There was another version as to why Inez ended her life. Shortly before her death, her biological mother had written to the family saying she was coming to pick up her daughter. The girl became depressed and said she would rather die than go to live with her mother. This story appeared to have some validity since in the national census, Inez and both her brothers were shown as living with their mother and stepfather in Rollins City, Wyoming in June of 1900, where they ran a hotel. Within the next few months, the children returned to Iowa for unknown reasons. In a queer twist of fate, Inez's half-sister was born to her father and his second wife, passed away also in 1900 when she was six years old. Inez's mother's Inez's mother, Nancy, better known as Angie, divorced and married a third time and became Mrs. Davis about 1904. She had a daughter named Emma. This tragic event in turn-of-the-century Midwest America normally would have fallen into obscurity, except for one reason. Inez is said to haunt a place that during those years was known as the Cottage Hotel. The hotel was built in the 1870s, and perhaps her uncle's grocery store was nearby. Why Inez would haunt this place has never fully been explained. There are others who are said to make their presence known after death at this building. A prime candidate might be Preston Harris, who in August 1901 was trying to steal a ride on the train and slipped while trying to get off. His legs were crushed by the train. He was transported by ambulance to the cottage hotel, where his left leg was amputated at the hip. His right leg was saved even though it had compound fractures with bones protruding through the flesh. In 1959, the hotel was renamed Nishna Cottage and became a nursing home. After 1976, it became a residential care facility for people who suffered from MPD, schizophrenia, alcoholism, and other types of substance abuse. It closed in 2005. Present day, it is known as Melbourne Manor and is said to be haunted by some of the patients that lived there for many years and possibly by any number of people who came to stay at the cottage hotel. Despite claims that EVPs have been captured at Malvern Manor from the spirit of Inez, chances are this is not her. If there's any mystery to this entire affair, it's why this young girl decided to end her life. Was she truly despondent over grades? Was it true she feared returning to her biological mother? Or could it have been the possibility of returning to live with her father and stepmother who had lost her daughter that same year? The truth was something Inez took with her as she looked at herself in the mirror facing the closet, and slipped the jump rope over her neck. The hope is that she found the peace she sought and which eluded her at that moment of her young life. So there you go. And very sad story. And again, I'm sure there's others like it, but because she supposedly haunts this Malvern Manor, which present day, you, I believe it allows, uh, you can visit it. I mean, it has a quite a history there. Um, and she's supposed to be one of the ghosts, or I, even though I don't know why she would be doing there, but I put a link here called hunted hunters, which is, is an interview with a current owner of Malvern Manor. So if you want to check that out, all right. The next story is out of CNN, and it's titled French woman found dead in Italian church was searching for ghost impossible TikTok stunt, police say. Oh boy. Here we go. Rome, Italy. A 22-year-old French woman whose blood-drained body was found in an abandoned church in northern Italy's Aosta Valley over the weekend had been looking for a haunted house believed to contain 
ghosts, according to police. She told family members about her plans before leaving the village near Lyon, where she lived, a police spokeswoman in the town of La Salle told CNN. Police believe the victim could have been attempting to carry out a TikTok stunt, adding that her death could be related to a ghost hunting competition being played in France on the social media platform. The other working theories are that it was a consented murder or sacrifice or an attempt to carry out a social media prank in the deconsecrated church. Police are still searching for a young man who was seen with her. There are also two other missing person cases in the area which police say could be related. According to the spokeswoman, the victim and a male friend have been seen in the area dressed like vampires. A witness interviewed by police say the young woman was pale and emaciated and the man had dark hair and olive skin. The witness told police investigators that she looked like a walking corpse. The dead woman, whose name has not been released, had been stabbed with what investigators say was a camping knife and had bled to death, according to medical examiner Robesta Testi. She also had two gunshots to her neck and one to her abdomen that police say may have, inflicted, may have been inflicted after she died. Some of the blood had been scraped off the floor and removed from the crime scenes, police told the news agency. There were no signs of struggle, police say. Police say they found a package of pink marshmallows and some groceries purchased at a local store near her body, and she was wearing beige leggings and a sweatshirt under a long dark coat. The woman had no documents or cell phone on her when a local resident discovered a decomposing body. The area prosecutor, Manlio de Ambrosi, told local media that they're also investigating the presence of a burgundy-colored van that was spotted on surveillance footage near the abandoned church last week. A spokesperson from the prosecutor's office declined to add further details. That is, you know, was it a stunt? She was sacrificed herself? I, I, I got to follow up on the story because there's a lot of questions. Very unusual. And she's emaciated. Anorexia, I mean, it sounds like almost anorexia, nervosa. Very, very interesting. I, I, I got to see where this goes. I hope they put out more information on it. Okay. Next story is also out of Stranger Than Fiction Stories, and it's titled The Secret of Crisfield Pond. Three boys are playing near an old mill pond on the outskirts of Crisfield, Maryland. An old man arrived carrying two bundles. He told the boys the sacks contain, contain either puppies or kittens, which he meant to drown. After the man threw the sacks into the water and left, they retrieved one of the bags intent on saving the animals, only to make a gruesome discovery. This is April 20th, 1923 in Crisfield, Maryland. Inside the bag was the headless bodies of two children and just the head of an older child. One of the victims was perhaps six to seven years of age, while the others were from a week to six months old. When the police dragged the pond situated near a brick kiln for the other bag, they found more than they bargained for. There were several bones, unquestionably those of infants, scattered throughout the bed of the pond. The police were perplexed by the fact that no complaints were made of children killed reaching them. They believed this was due to the children being sacrificed in voodoo rituals. Police Chief, Chief James W. Kerwin said the populace on the eastern shore peninsula were taciturn, and they never told on one another, no matter what they were accused of doing. Dr. C. E. Collins, who examined the bodies of the children found in the bags, testified at the inquiry he thought they were dead about six months. He planned to test the bodies to determine whether there was any indication of the presence of formaldehyde. He said this was found in all kinds of embalming fluid, which might indicate the bodies were stolen from the graves. He also kept the records of births and deaths and planned to check the death of any children against the births recorded at his office. The three boys named Edward Justice, 11, Edward Landon, 9, and Leonard War, 10, said the old man had on leather putties and was riding a red bike. Police could only find one person who owned a red frame bike as described by the boys. It belonged to Carnett Brown. He admitted to owning the bike but said he didn't know anything about throwing bodies into the pond. Nothing more came of the story, leading one to believe the residents of the area were keeping some type of horrific secret which unfortunately took the life of children. If the remains were stolen from a cemetery, this and the fact they were decapitated points only to cult practices. I mean, which, the lesser of two evils here is that these 
bodies were stolen from the grave, even if they were for rituals, because the other more horrific is that they these were live children that were killed. I don't know which one's worse, but there you go. Very, very weird. Back in 1923, 100 years ago. So here we've come to a, a, the end of another series of eerie news. But I will be back with you very, very soon because there's a lot of weird stuff going on. And we will dive into it together. Till next time.